Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. My name is Zach and uh, tonight we're just going to kind of do a very chill stream. Just kind of whatever I, I feel like uh, looking at in terms of YouTube videos. Just going to pull them up and kind of comment on them. So if you have any suggestions, um, unfortunately I don't allow links in the chat. So you'll have to either just tell me what to look up by uh, giving me the title and I'll look it up on YouTube. Or you can contact me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever other um, site you want to contact me on and I will, I'll give you the link there in the in the chat pretty soon so you can do that um, but I think we're gonna start tonight with a video from bleep blomp Ben who is a twitch streamer um, also happens to be from Minnesota uh, but he has a lot of really cool videos that he makes and this one is about the suburbs and how they are not the best form and um, as someone who is an urban planner by by training that is my master's degree I would have to agree. So I think I'll have a lot to say about this particular video. Um, and yeah, so, you know, have anything you, you'd like to chat about tonight? Um, even if it's not the current video, I'm just kind of in a, in a whatever sort of mood. So feel free. We'll just have a free range in discussion. Other than that, I think we will just get started now and I'll, I'll pause as I see fit. So here's Bleep, Bleep Blomp Ben. I'll give you the link for the, the video too in, in a minute here. And uh, this is on why we should abolish the suburbs. If you live in a suburb, you may have noticed that it's more than possible for you to go through your entire day without ever even seeing your neighbors. In suburbs, often people can walk right into their car from their attached garage, drive to work, and only ever really interact with either co-workers or employees at stores and restaurants. Such a life constrains the entirety of your interactions with other people to your family and people with which you have purely monetary relations with. Even if you are friends in some sense with your co-workers, your combined experience will still be relatively narrow considering the fact that they are living similarly isolated lives as you are. When and that's very true, you know, as, as someone who grew up in the suburbs, and someone who has studied urban planning a whole lot, um, I would say the isolation is is a pretty big feature of them. You know, you, you in, instead of the way things are, are set up in, say, a, a central core of a city or any sort of even a small downtown, say, in like a small city or a small town, uh, where you have you know the corner shops that are within walking distance, you you see your neighbors as you go out uh, and about and do your business. Um, you may even work in the same area that you, that you live, you know. Uh, instead of that, they, they have what's known as, it's, in, you know, in technical jargon, it's known as Euclidean zoning, uh, which is a really unfortunate kind of misnomer because it has nothing to do with Euclidean geometry, which is what most people would, you know, assume. Instead, it has to do with a... a case which solidified zoning as a legitimate form of governance in the United States. It's Euclid versus, I don't even remember, it's not really important. Uh, but the idea is that in Euclidean zoning, you have segregated uses. So that's why in your neighborhood, if you live in the, sub in the, the suburbs, probably everything around you for, you know, a quarter mile, a mile, maybe even more is just housing. You know, that that's, that's what's known as residential zoning. And then you may have a, con a commercial district, and that's just commercial. You don't ha have people living above the shops. You don't have uh, industry that, that's close by either. And uh, one of the effects is that you end up having to take your car, like, everywhere. Like, it, it, it's, it's almost an impossibility. Now, I mean, it is, if you really struggle at it and you really get to know, say, a bus line very well, you, you may perhaps be able to get around on, on mass transit, but still it's going to have drawbacks like, uh, as I found out recently, when I, when I uh, tried to take the bus back from my work on a Sunday, I found out that the bus that I had been relying on doesn't actually run on Sundays. Uh, and so I had to walk uh, about an hour, so it probably came out to about five miles, before I got to a, a, a bus line that happened to run on Sundays, and I could take it the rest of the way home. Uh, so it's stuff like that. You may be able to get by without a car, but it's, it's very difficult and very unlikely. Not to mention, you know, if you're going any distance with groceries, that can be a, a real pain, you know, to have to haul everything onto a bus and then from the bus stop to back to your house. And especially if you got kids with you as well, it just things complicate very quickly if you don't have a car in the suburbs. But one of the effects of having a car and having to go everywhere 
buy a car is that you're not really talking to a lot of people. You don't interact with a lot of people. Well, I mean, you may in, in more negative ways, say if someone cuts you off or whatever, um, but uh, you're not having much positive interaction with your neighbors. And once you finally get to your destination, it may be so far away from your house that no one you see there is anyone that, that you live next to. So you don't, you don't build those bonds that you, you naturally would living in, say, a smaller town or a more concentrated, what's, what's known as a, a mixed-use development where you have things like people living above storefronts and you know, industrial zones that are just on the edges of, of a residential area or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely agree with Ben here that, that suburbs are pretty isolating in that respect. Um, it's, I think the statistic is something like the average suburban person knows maybe less than five neighbors, at least by name. Um, and that number's at least twice that for people that live in cities. So it's, it's borne out by the statistics as well. Let's continue on a little bit. While you may take this as mere coincidence of industrialization and modernization of the U.S. economy in the 1950s, the truth is more intentional and sinister than you might imagine. The very existence of the suburbs itself was an intentional effort to amplify racial segregation in America, erode social movements, and limit workers' freedom of movement within the country. That's another very important point. Uh, there was what's known as white flight back in, in around like, um, oh, I would say the 70s is when it really got going, that, that the inner cores of cities started really emptying out of a lot of the white people that lived there uh, because of racial animosities, things like integration. They just didn't want to deal with having, having to even live next to uh, black people or, or have them have the same social standing in, in any way. And so they moved out to these suburbs where they could, you know, be by more people like themselves. And it's, it's worth noting that it was primarily the, the at least middle class people that did that because you have to be able to own a house, uh, at least in this initial phase. Now that, that things have, now that these suburbs have matured for a while, it is more common to have um, some more multifamily housing, you know, apartment complexes and stuff like that. Even those, though, are pretty isolating. You know, I, I kind of tend to think of them as almost like desert islands because if you're someone that, that lives in a suburb and you need to live in an apartment, more than likely you are on the lower income scale of things. Not always, but, but it's a good likelihood, uh, at least in the, the suburbs around Minneapolis-St. Paul. Um, so you're, you're less likely to be able to afford a car or at least a car that works all the time. And yet there's no real place that a lot of these things are close to. They're not really even a place themselves. They're just kind of a holding area where you go, you go, go to sleep, you, you do your stuff at home, and then you, you leave to go to work, you leave to go out to, you know, uh, find entertainment or whatever. Um, and, and that, too, is just, it's a strange sort of isolation because you, at, at one time you have a lot of people living together, but very few interactions because you're still so dependent on that car too. It's, it's again, being dependent on cars um, and just not having any place that you can even walk to. So it, just, it very much lessens the amount of social interactions. And they're even oriented that way too. A lot of the time they'll have, uh, instead of being up against the road and having a sidewalk going by, they'll be set back and they'll call, you know, like you know, whispering acres or some really inane sort of name. Uh, Usually, of, the joke is usually of the trees that they've cut down or something like that. So it'll be like Elm Square, where they what they cut down all the elms, that sort of thing. Um, and so the, the, everything that, that's being said by the signage and, and by the orientation of things is, is, stay, is, is saying, you know, unless you have business here, stay away. You know, you'd probably be viewed with suspicion if you just happen to wander through, right? So... Again, it's, it's that more of that, that isolating sort of um, language that they're employing to keep people away. Um, and I think it's intentional as well. Uh, I think, you know, I'm sure the idea is to, to cut down on crime and that sort of thing. But at the same time, it also cuts down on community and social interaction. And a lot of times, too, uh, apartment complexes, especially in suburbs, are not very popular projects. People, all sorts of NIMBYs will come out to... Uh, 
various town meetings when they're when they're talking about approving one project or another and it's always the same tired stuff oh there's gonna be people coming and going it's gonna be loud they're gonna bring drugs and crime you know these are all just dog whistles for poor people and and people of color um, not being as good as the people that already live there and bringing in their you know essential low-class stuff along with them and we just want to keep that stuff out of there um, so that's another reason that they they tend to make these things somewhat isolated is to say oh no 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 we're not going to disrupt your your neighborhood at all this will be set aside it'll be out of the way only one entrance in and out you won't have cars racing up and down the streets all this stuff all these ways that they try to appease the the, the homeowners that live in the area already but again the effect is is to separate them from those communities um yeah let's continue on though as the New Deal was being drafted, politicians and wealthy industrialists were concerned of a growing socialist movement driven by a coalition of labor organizers and civil rights leaders in the thriving example of the Soviet Union. Drafting up a plan for a new suburbia was central to their design for breaking apart leftist coalitions while making a profit off of that very destruction. First, they worked tirelessly to stoke racial divisions alongside a promise to white Americans in the city that they could move to suburbia and live in all white neighborhoods in relative affluence. They then built those suburbs around factories and gave white Americans the promise of a middle-class life with economic opportunities for their children. Following this, a system of highways and cars were marketed to offer freedom to the middle-class workers. And I really like that he brought up this, this idea of uh, highways being plowed into the middle of cities because that's something that's often not really thought about by people that even live, live within a city. They just They just take... Highway development is just a matter of course, uh, but if you look at the way that things develop, it's almost entirely in service of suburban commuters. So people that still have jobs within the, the city core, uh, but live way out in the suburbs. So they, they put in these huge multi-lane highways, they plow them right through the middle of neighborhoods, often disrupting, you know, vibrant, uh, you know, well, well knit together neighborhoods just in the name of moving people that don't even live in the city that, that they are disrupting. Uh, I mean, th this happened in, in St. Paul, where I live. Uh, there was a neighborhood called the Rondo neighborhood. And it was one of the, the most affluent black neighborhoods in all of the Twin Cities. Uh, it had all, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was probably around 100 to 200 black owned businesses. Uh, there was all kinds of arts organizations. It was it was a full, you know, flourishing community. And when they decided to put in Highway 94 that, that runs between the downtowns of Minneapolis and St. Paul and then out east and west of the cities, uh, well, where did they put it? But straight through the middle of that neighborhood. And it really crushed it. And it became impoverished after that point. It, it totally split the heart of the neighborhood apart because... If you think about it, uh, a, the way that people interact with a, a highway, especially a very wide highway, is, is not so dissimilar from the way that people would interact with a river or another you know, geographical barrier. There's only so many points that you can cross it. Um, you can't just walk out into it, of course. And it, it disrupts things. So what used to be a two block walk over over to you know get your grocery shopping or whatever now becomes a 12 block walk because you have to go all the way down to the next overpass and then come all the way back and just you know up and down and up and down just to do what used to be very simple uh, a very simple action um, and you of course have to reroute mass transit around it you have to reroute all sorts of transportation around it it's it's very disruptive to functioning communities and this is all in the in the, the name of, of getting people in and out of this the city core very quickly and also making it so those nice white suburbanites don't have to interact with the the poorer maybe less white neighborhoods in in and out as on their way in and out of the city they can just come straight into the middle of the the core go to their job probably go into a parking deck and at the end of the day come back out reverse the thing. You don't have to go through any neighborhoods. It's just very minimal uh, 
travel time or at least travel distance to, to get to the highway and then be on your way. And you don't have to see people. You don't have to talk to people. It's, it's a way of uh, keeping them at arm's length, really. So I'm really glad that he, he brought this up. Let's continue on. He's got a lot more to say about this part. To still enjoy some of the cultural aspects and economic benefits of city nearby. At every stage, there were deliberate plans that were put in place to ensure that the rise of suburbs would mean the fall of leftist movements within the United States. First and foremost, the aggressive segregation efforts amplified racism within the country. By preventing cultural exchange and any feelings of shared community between white Americans in the suburbs and the black Americans who were denied homes in those suburbs. Real estate developers even went so far as to put racial covenants on the land they developed, contractually requiring homeowners to never sell their home to any person of color. Living in racially segregated communities allowed continued propagation of racism and combined with a threat to white homeowners that a black neighbor might lower their property value, real violence towards black Americans was instigated and amplified by real estate developers and mortgage lenders. Mm, and the real estate is a very important component of all of this too, because what do they do to uh, ensure that, for instance, their kids still got to go to the best schools in, in the state once they moved out of the inner city and there was less children per square mile just by necessity. Uh, but they, they made sure to m divide up school districts in a way that, that included the, the areas that they wanted, uh, but also pretty much across the country. I don't know if there's any place in the U.S. that's different, that does this differently, but, but as far as I know, every place across the country funds their school districts by property taxes. So if you happen to live in an affluent district, you're going to have more money per student. And, and that's, that's, that's a way to ensure, yes, that, that your kids get, you know, all the benefits of all the affluence that you are bringing with you as you leave the, the inner city. But on the flip side, it makes sure that the, the people that are left behind have even worse schools and have even less opportunity to move up in life. You know, it's still true in America that, that education is one of the biggest predictors of lifetime earnings and lifetime you know, success, at least economically. Uh, so that's, that's one way to keep things as they are and, and keep the people that you don't like held back. Even if it's not explicit, you know, there's, there's nothing in any of these, these laws or codes that says, well, if you are a person of color or if you are a per poor person, you deserve less. But that is how it ends up shaking out. That's just the, the de facto reality of it because of the way things that have been set up. And um, it's partially deliberate and it's partially just people not caring about people <laughs> that are, are not living by them, really. So yeah, let's keep, on, let's keep on going though. This was one of the original uses of property value as a tool of political influence that persists to this very day, which brings us to the next detail. The homes that were sold as a monument to individual freedom wound up to be nothing but a chain, holding down workers in communities centered around a small few powerful businesses. With so much debt wrapped up in a house, individuals living in the suburbs were far less mobile than their city-dwelling counterparts, and as such, their wages and benefits could be driven down once they settled in, and they would begin to vote on behalf of the only industry in town. Workers forced to commit to a single company knew that it would be hard for them to leave and find a job elsewhere, bringing them to vote to ensure that business stayed afloat. Doing so, they began to advocate for their own exploiters in an arms race between cities to drive public spending down in an effort to appease the infinite desire for tax cuts. <laughs> uh, so we have a comment coming in. David GL, keep your government hands off my crypto. Not really sure where that's coming from. Not talking about crypto probably at all tonight. That's just something that I don't really know much about. Um, feel free to elaborate, though. If you have anything to contribute, you want to talk about suburbs? Because that's kind of what we're talking about now. Among the wealthy industrialists that owned the factories they worked in. Additionally, anything that bankers arbitrarily decided would drive property values down would stoke rage in the minds of people who viewed their homes to be their life savings. And important to, to note also that the practice of redlining, that is uh, legally not giving people home loans who, who are living currently in a certain area, which just happened to be the, the, the uh, more uh, p the areas where people of color lived. Uh, that was legal until I think early 80s, something like that. So we've had pretty egregious segregation policies still. 
Uh, okay, so David GL says, I hate the government. That's fine. I'm okay with the suburbs. People have free association in this country. Don't like the city. You can move elsewhere. I refuse to live in a pod. Okay, well, as, as I was talking about earlier, uh, what then do you think about the idea of these massive roads being plowed into the middle of cities? which, you know, destroys people's free association in, in a pretty um, concrete and, and large way uh, for the benefit of people that don't live in those cities. Where's the choice in that? Where's, where's the idea that, you know, people can live whichever way they like? Because that's, the, that, that's not how things end up going. It ends up going for the people that, that end up having the most money, uh, which tends to be the people in the suburbs. So... I refuse to live in a pod. No one's asking you to live in a pod, though, either. Um, there's plenty of great housing within any major city, I'm sure. Uh, and if there's not, it definitely should be built as well, and it can be built. Uh, there's no reason you have to live in a pod. No reason you have to be feeling crowded. It, it just takes a different mentality, really, to enjoy living in a city. And, not, and nothing says you have to live in a city, but the idea that a suburb is a good alternative is is another matter um so yeah so there's there's things like uh arts and entertainment and community gathering spaces you don't have to make your domicile like the the heart of all of your activities and especially if you're in a city where there's a lot of opportunity to do otherwise at least in non-pandemic times um yeah you have much more options that way too and then the alternative would be living in the country where you aren't taking as many resources as someone who lives in the suburbs. Uh, you aren't requiring the same level of, of infrastructure to be built to, to satisfy your needs. Uh, you know, you're, you're off the grid with things like sewer and uh, even in some cases electricity uh, or internet or, or things like that if you get satellites. Um, so that's fine too. There's nothing wrong with wanting to live in the country, living away from people, um, or having a different sort of community, or even a small town. Nothing against small towns either. We're just, we're just talking about suburbs specifically, uh, which is the most inefficient form. And if you look at the, the tax base that any given road in a suburb produces, um, you're going to find that over the course of that, that road's uh, lifetime, its, its needs for maintenance are going to be much greater than the revenue being pulled in by the adjacent property, you know, through property taxes and that sort of thing. All right. Road, road, I didn't say roads should be privatized. Um, privatized roads would be built more efficiently. There's absolutely nothing more, essentially more efficient about privatizing something. Look at our healthcare system. How, how, how efficient is that in the United States? I mean, come on. You, you can't even go to any doctor you want to. It has to be within network. And it's all usually tied to your employer, which is another inefficiency, which means that if you want to leave your job, you have to consider that you might have to leave your health insurance at the same time. So privatizing things does, is not going to make things better. Absolutely. That's just going to restrict choice and freedom. People should have freedom of movement, shouldn't they? You know, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Cities are ruined with all the Democrats running them. Well, yeah, they, they, I'm, I'm not a Democrat, so I am a leftist. Uh, so I'd agree with you there. The Democrats are, are not doing a great job of running major cities. They, they, they like to put a nice veneer on things. They, they like to put uh, like a diversity of faces in good positions. They like to fund charities and, and do all these other sort of neoliberal uh, policy solutions that don't end up panning out in the end. So what we need is, is something more. What we need is something closer to, say, socialism, where we all make sure that we are providing the, the basic necessities for living, a basic platform for people to push off of and, and become whatever it is they, they want to be, reach their potential, that sort of thing. Uh, so food, water, housing, you know, transportation, these sorts of things. Um, and at the same time, democratizing people's workplaces so they have more of a say in their daily economic lives. I'm all for that sort of thing. I love that sort of choice and freedom. 
Uh, I think the mayors of some of those liberal cities encourage people to burn them down. Well, boy, there's a lot wrong with that sentence there because I live in St. Paul. I drive through Minneapolis quite a lot. It's not burnt down. There was a handful of buildings that got burned. There was a Target that got looted, which I, I believe is back up and running now. There was a liquor store that got burnt down. There was a, a condo that hadn't been fully built yet that got burned down. And a random collection of other shops and, and, and businesses. So there was a very small fraction of the city. It was only one spot. And uh, likewise in St. Paul, there was, there was an area of, of um, destruction where, yeah, a couple of businesses got burnt down. Nobody's house got burnt down or anything. Um, so to say that they, that they allow the cities to be burnt down is, is a way of an overreach for one thing. It's just inaccurate. Uh, but for another thing, encouraging them? No, you should have seen when Mayor Fry of, or Frey, excuse me, of Minneapolis went down to the BLM protest. He was booed off the streets because they were unhappy with the way he handled things. He, he waited until the very last minute to uh, arrest the officers who were um, responsible for George Floyd's murder. So to say that they some, he somehow encouraged that? No, he did everything to protect the police department and to, um, I mean, he authorized the use of tear gas on the protesters. Tell me that he's encouraging them? I, <laughs> that's nonsense. That doesn't make any sense at all to me. So... City's not a war zone. Like, okay. All right. I was hoping you're going to be a little more good faith than this, Mr. Or I'm assuming Mr. David, just going by your name. Uh, but if you're just going to troll, like, move it along. I don't, I don't got time for that sort of thing. Let's continue on. Things like public transit, small businesses and residential districts, food producing gardens, even something as simple as painting a house a different color all became public enemy number one in the newly created NIMBY class. And this is among the white Americans who got the better end of the deal, the ones who were promised a life of relative affluence, specifically relative to the black communities which were forced into economic desperation. There are many ways in which black Americans during the New Deal era were forced into poverty and struggle, too many to cover in one video. So I will talk about just a small handful of the tactics used to build racism into the very core of suburban development. First is the highway system, which was designed Very to optimize important. not transit times or traffic congestion, but rather to maximize the destruction of black neighborhoods. And in fact, if you wanted to actually maximize the number of people moved, um, you can look at, this is something that, that urban planners and, and, and stuff like uh, traffic engineers look at, you can look at any grade of road, like even up to a highway, multi-lane highway, and the number of cars it moves, the number of, of people that it moves per hour is always going to be less than a given, say, subway line or, or light rail line, and most bus lines as well, especially if they have what's known as a dedicated right-of-way, which means a special lane for them only to drive in so that they're not having to weave in and out of traffic. Um, and then if they can pre do things like preempt stoplights so they can make them turn green as they come up to them, that maximizes the efficiency too. There's a bunch of different things you can do to, to make your transit system even better and even more friendly to, to people such as those with uh, physical disabilities instead of having uh, the, the way they tend to do it in the metro here is with when, when someone in a wheelchair needs to get on the bus, they have this whole complex system where this, uh, this loading system, or what would you even call it, like a platform, comes out from underneath the stairs and it gets lowered down to the ground. They wheel them on, you know, they, they make sure that the, uh, that they like clip a belt behind them so they don't fall backwards. Then they lift them onto the bus, they wheel in, and then have, they have a bunch of different clamps that have to clamp to the wheelchair once they're on the bus to keep them from, you know, falling around as, as the bus moves around. Instead of all that, if everyone, say, boarded at the platform, boarded a platform that was at the same level as the bus, so you just go straight on into the bus, well, then we could all enter it relatively easily. Uh, the, the only drawback to that, of course, is that it takes more money to make platforms. But then you also have an opportunity to do things like make a heated shelter, which is very important for places like Minnesota, where we can get temperatures down to negative 20 in some of our cold snaps, negative 20 Fahrenheit, I should say. Uh, and that also gives 
uh, areas where you can have, say, ticket vending, so you can buy the ticket ahead of time before you get on the bus, all these other sorts of things that can be become available just by investing in uh, transit platforms instead. And it just makes things move more efficiently. So, uh, yeah. So if you really want to move people, if that's really your goal, even if you're extending it out to the suburbs, mass transit is the way to go. It's, it's always the most efficient way to move people, the most people per hour, on, on any given stretch of, of transportation line. The development of highways offered the racist political leaders an easy excuse to go in and demolish entire neighborhoods with the express purpose of demolishing any and all wealth that black Americans had managed to earn over the first half of the century. People were evicted from their homes, businesses were torn down, and communities were made inaccessible by anything but cars, all without any reasonable compensation from the federal government. Wherever black and that, that's a point of contention that, that some people will make, saying that uh, when you do things like to, to seize land in order to do a public project, you have to do what's called eminent domain, which means that you're supposed to offer a fair price to the person that owns the property. Of course, if you're a renter, you don't own that property, so you're just SOL, basically. Um, but even to the people that actually do end up getting the compensation to, to be able to take the land uh, for a public pur purpose, say, say a road, uh, there's there's a lot of debate whether or not that they end up on average getting fair compensation because they, they'll they'll do sneaky tactics like they'll they'll find the the worst few or the worst block in say a neighborhood uh, you know the, that's got the most rundown houses the most abandoned houses uh, the most drug crime something like that and then they'll just declare the neighborhood blighted and once you do that you can get a very much lower price per house for whatever you're offering the people. And they've done some reform with that in, in uh, Minnesota in particular. Uh, it used to be that you could take a, a and, and in fact, federally, you still can take uh, private land. So, so in the case of Minnesota, the, the thing that changed it was they took a, a small-time dealership, car dealership. You, know, you don't get a lot of property taxes for a dealership because it's, it's, it's a small building relative to the size of the whole property. So most of it's considered unimproved if it's just a parking lot. Uh, but anyway, so, so not a lot of tax revenue coming into that one very large area where this dealership was. And they wanted to build Best Buy headquarters. And so what they did was they, they, they declared the, the nearby neighborhood blighted, which then included somehow the uh, dealership. And they took the entire dealership and gave it to another private entity, entity which was Best Buy. They, they, built, they ended up building their headquarters. You can see it now. It's just off of uh, 494 and uh, Penn Avenue, I believe. And that, they claimed, the, the reason for that, they claimed that they, they could do that in the past was for economic development. That is still federally seen as a legitimate way to, to use eminent domain for economic development, even if that means taking from one private business and giving it to another private business. And of course, they were compensated, not as much as it was worth, I'm sure. I'm sure they lost a ton of business doing it that way. Uh, but then in Minnesota, they decided, no, 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 you can't take, you can't use eminent domain to take from one private entity and give it to another. So at least they got rid of that part of it. But that's not to say they still don't use underhanded tactics like devaluing, purposely devaluing neighborhood and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, let's continue on. Black Americans had managed to develop thriving communities with economic opportunity. Highway planners made sure to go in and bulldoze their livelihoods in a very literal sense. By closing off neighborhoods with highways, the opportunity for black Americans to find good work with high wages was now constrained not only by the racism of many employers, but also by the limited access to transportation. This allowed industrialists to keep wages incredibly low for black Americans as there was little left in the way of economic opportunity in the only neighborhoods they were allowed to live in. To add to the extreme nature of this community destruction program, industrialists placed their most toxic and polluting factories right in the heart of black communities to force onto them the health consequences of living in an environment soaked in toxic chemicals. And that's what's known as environmental racism. Uh, the, the people that tend to be poor tend to be people of color. And the places where the most polluting businesses or, or usually industrial um, complexes tend to be situated and allowed to operate 
tends to be in the poorest parts of town. So just, you know, again, de facto, they, they end up polluting the, you know, with uh, heavy metals, with, with other sort of, um, you know, carbon monoxide, with any, any sort of air pollutant that you can think of, uh, the poorest areas. And not only does that, you know, worsen their health, obviously, makes them live shorter lives, but it can do things like if it's uh, heavy metals, it can uh, have cognitive effects. So it will lower the average IQ. You know, it's just like when they, they stop putting lead pipes in, into cities, they stopped using them for drinking water, people's IQs on average went up. So that's another thing to think about, this idea of an environmental racism um, that he's bringing up. Such an act of intentional environmental negligence in black neighborhoods can only be described as a thinly veiled act of genocidal violence towards people of color. Ever since the creation of the suburbs, the tying of workers to their homes, and the segregation of our communities, wealthy capitalists have been pitting workers in these communities against each other, using the low wages and... <laughs> I just, I gotta laugh at the, the stock footage that he finds. Um, I should, I should find the, the, the archive. There's, there's an online database of, of just stock footage of whatever you can think of that that's all public domain you can use it for your videos and stuff so that's what he tends to use which works really well he's very effective at, at piecing these together and make it look very professional um and it really adds to the narrative that he's he's putting on there but <laughs> just the weird people and the poses they do it's just it's funny sometimes uh so tribunus plebis media or podcast excuse me nice to see you tonight thank you for for joining me uh, says not just demolishing and dividing neighborhoods, they also chose where to place and not to place. Absolutely true. Another good point. Uh, I can think of a good example of that in in my city of St. Paul. There's a a section of uh, 35, which 35 runs all the way from Minnesota all the way down to Texas, and and in the cities it splits off. So one section, 35E goes to St. Paul, 35W goes to uh, Minneapolis, and then they join back together in the north and south. But anyway, there's a section of 35E uh, just south of the downtown that that has that just happens to run at the bottom of this these bluffs where some of the richest parts of St. Paul are. That's it's this this uh, Summit Avenue is, is the the name of the the uh, street that runs along the the top of the bluff, and it's it's like the Cathedral Hill neighborhood. Very wealthy. It's like it literally is where F. Scott Fitzgerald grew up. Um, so it's, it's that sort of thing. It's like that kind of money. I mean, there's mansion after mansion after mansion. Anyway, they overlook this bluff that now has a highway running along it. So part of the deal of them getting to put in that highway was that they had to use asphalt instead of concrete, uh, which meant it, it, it was a reduction in noise, which is all they cared about. Uh, but also it, it means they have to repair it more often. But then also, it, it, they disallowed semi-trucks from that point, so it cut down on, on the noise even more. So noise is a form of pollution, and in this case, these, these wealthy people were managed to throw their weight around and get the city to make all these concessions to reduce it in their, their wealthy area, to, to not spoil their, their atmosphere as much. But it happens all the time. You're never going to see a, a sewage plant in the middle of a wealthy neighborhood. Um, because they just wouldn't stand for it. And they tend to have connections that can get people not reelected. So, I mean, so much for our, you know, one person, one vote sort of a system. It often is who has the most leverage ends up getting to, to hold the reins of power or, or who has the friends that have the most leverage and that sort of thing. Uh, so the rest of the comment was, which could create and sustain wealth, but also make minority neighborhoods even less accessible and further erode the wealth and opportunities. Absolutely true. Uh, always think that's worth noting. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, no, no, that, that is the perfect time to, to make that comment because that's what we were talking about right now. So I thank you for it. Tribunus Plebus Media. And I don't, I, I still haven't gotten any of the bots going, so I can't do a shout out. But uh, if, if you like discussion of, of, uh, leftist politics, you should definitely follow Tribunus Plebus, the Tribunus Plebus podcast. Uh, they also have a great podcast, as the name suggests, but they're, they're just getting into streaming, so give them a follow, and uh, and hopefully we can uh, get them a good followership, and, and they too can be on their road to uh, making affiliate, which which I myself am on. So I'm, I'm getting pretty close, actually. I'm, I'm trying to get my streaming hours up, 
Uh, I think I will have enough streaming days and streaming hours this month. And then I also just broke uh, almost 60 followers now. So I have the over 50. So that's exciting too. And all I need to have is, is the right number of concurrent average viewers. And that's the, that's the tough part always. So I'm trying to keep on a schedule, doing this every Sunday night at 7 p.m. To, to about 9 p.m. And then also every Friday night at the, at the same with the same time frame, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. So tune in for that too. And uh, just to let you know, if you're if you're just joining, I do kind of what a, a whatever stream on Sunday. It's very casual. It's more more discussion and interaction with uh, followers. And uh, I usually just pick out some videos to watch and, and comment on them. And then on Friday nights is when I do my theory stream, and we listen to a chapter of a uh, leftist theory book. Right now we're getting through The Conquest of Bread, which Tribunus Plebis uh, podcast, Sean from that, that podcast, was, was just on Friday night. And we're going to join up again this upcoming Friday to do uh, part two of chapter 12, or, or the second half, I guess, of chapter 12 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. And that's one of the, one of the like, founding documents, or founding books, I should say, of uh, anarcho-communist thought. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of, a lot of great insights have come from that, especially from the guests I've had on. I've had a lot of really great guests. So I've been very fortunate to, to meet those people and, and have them on. And if you're interested too, if you're, if you're someone who likes to give your opinions about politics and you can do it in a good faith way, that's not just derailing discussion. Uh, even if you don't necessarily agree with, with everything that the left says, um, you know, I'd be happy to have you on. So contact me through one of the various social media sites that, that I'm on. I gave you the link earlier in the show. You can, you can rewind it later on if you missed that part. I'll probably give it at the end of the show as well, my, my link tree. Uh, and then uh, we can set up a time to, to have you on. So keep that in mind as you watch. All right, let's continue on with, with Ben's video here. More diverse areas as a tool to lower the wages of white middle-class neighborhoods. The social isolation that suburbs brings means that many white Americans rarely have to interact with any black neighbors that they might have, and are unlikely to hear about the experience of anyone that lives a life much different from their own. This leads to an erosion of a sense of community and solidarity, and makes far easier the work of scapegoating in order to continue to drive wages and benefits down, and to stoke fear and hatred which funds an ever-growing police state apparatus meant to criminalize black life and force black Americans to work as slaves in a horrific prison system. The and he's not just being hyperbolic when he says forcing black people to work as slaves. You may not be aware. You may be new to the left. You haven't been uh, following along um, stuff uh, recently, but one of the, the, the loophole to the, uh, oh, I want to say it's the 14th Amendment, the one that criminalizes, or that, that abolishes, that abolished, I should say, quote unquote, abolished slavery, left uh, the, there was a loophole left that allowed people that were incarcerated to still be slaves not figurative slaves but literal slaves it is, is literally still in the u.s constitution that if you are uh, imprisoned if you're in the prison system you can be treated as a slave and oftentimes that is literally what they do is they they work them for literally no wage or a you know, such a pittance that it might as well be no wage. You know, we're talking, you know, 20 cents an hour, something like that, basically being a slave. So, uh, yeah, and, and that's all in, in the idea of enforcing the, the current hierarchy, the current system, basically, and, and that police work hand in hand with the prison system. They're the ones that, that send them down that pipeline. They're the ones who identify people early, that they, they want to get out of, uh, neighborhood it just it tends to be people of certain colors that are not white and they they do what they can to label them as as thugs or criminals or whatever and do what they can to get them into the prison system so they can keep on snatching them off the streets whenever they feel like it basically you know it's a it's a sad system and it, it basically is just to enforce current property rights and the current regime of property ownership the very foundation of suburbs is racism. The homes were intended to be inaccessible and unavailable to black Americans. 
The highways to and from the suburbs were designed to destroy black wealth. While some forms of the original sin of the suburbs are now illegal under the law, a great deal of their underlying purpose remains. He's, he's alluding again to redlining, which, which was finally outlawed, thank goodness. But like I said earlier, uh, you still have the way that school districts are funded based on geography uh, and property taxes. So that is is not explicitly racist, but the, the effect is racist because if you are a person of color, if you're not white, you tend to be poor in this country. We, on average, more, more on average, you are going to be a poor person. That's just how it has uh, shaken out. And... Because of that, your children, your offspring, uh, are going to be more li likely to have an underfunded school that they go to, which, you know, just kind of, it's one domino after another leading up to the same sort of cycles repeating themselves. So, uh, yeah, again, it's not, it's not out and out racism. There's, not, there's no mention of race in any of these codes or any of these laws, but the effect is racist, and you can't really deny it and bankers and realtors still use their power to generate extreme racial inequality. The lack of racial integration and economic mobility in the United States today is literally built into the design of our entire neighborhoods. Their origin and design were all part of an effort to amplify racial segregation, stoke racism, and suppress efforts to organize a multiracial coalition of workers for the common public good. If we truly want to live in an integrated and diverse world with economic prosperity, then we must abandon the suburban mythology of American dreams and nuclear families. Instead, we must craft a cosmopolitan vision of a culturally rich melting pot with walkable cities, public transit, and a sense of community built on daily interactions with a diverse set of neighbors. We must build support networks within our communities based on trust and social connectedness and the solidarity that comes along with knowing that all of our needs are intertwined. We need to acknowledge that our system today was built on racism for the benefit of wealthy capitalists, and we need to dismantle these systems and build new ones based on solidarity. So just before the, the video ends here, I just want to throw in, he's doing a really good job of identifying what the problems are and, and what some of the, the common solutions can be. Um, he's giving you kind of a, a thumbnail sketch. We need better transportation. We need better housing. We need walkable cities. These are the sorts of things that, that uh, there's a school of thought in urban planning called new urbanism. And if you're interested in how cities can be better for everybody, uh, you should look into new urbanism, especially there's the Congress for the new urbanism. They, they still have an active YouTube channel. I don't think they do podcasts anymore, unfortunately. And, and, and really, if you know of any good uh, new urbanist podcast, I would love to hear them because I've been searching around and I haven't really found a whole lot. It seems that the, the recent wave that, that kind of got going in, in like the mid 2010s or so is, is kind of died down around these sorts of ideas, which is unfortunate to see. Uh, I really wish people would focus more on making cities better. Uh, but yeah, if you know any good podcasts, especially, but also YouTube channels, uh, let me know sometime and uh, I'll be happy to feature them in future videos uh, because there's, there's a lot of really great thought that was developed th through the new urbanist movement which came out in basically the 80s and still continues today it, they, they still keep refining their work and, and their theory and stuff but it's a lot of a lot of revolutionary stuff including things like uh, getting rid of zoning except for you know noxious uses like like uh, uh, heavy industry, things that, that would come in conflict with people's living arrangements. So staying away from environmental racism, but other than that, allowing neighborhoods to kind of develop as, as they will, you know, with as much or as little density as, as uh, people are asking for, uh, as well as having a variety of, of goods and services available all within walking distance, making those social interactions more common, making the availability of jobs better, um, and then combining that with, with good public transportation so you're not having to worry about a car that can uh, break down, you know, a lot more reliable to, to collectivize that risk with, with a, a public transportation system. And a lot more efficient, too, you know. Um, I'll, I'll get into to more urban planning stuff later, but let's just finish up the video. ...and meeting real human needs. In short, suburbs are racist, and they need to be abolished. 
so you can go check out his stuff he's on oh snap Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. Do this Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell. I also stream every day on Twitch. Link in the description. Take care of yourself and each other. Very good. So, I really like Ben's work. Uh, he's one of the people that I, I follow and, and subscribe to on Twitch. Um, and then he puts, he puts all his stuff up here on on YouTube. And he does these videos just kind of randomly. But they're always, they're always really insightful. He does a good job. Especially for being so young. Anyway, that was a really good video. I really appreciate his contributions. Um, let's move on. Let's see what else we can find.